in this video we will talk about the basics of computer science. Now this class is Java focused and therefore we are looking at object oriented languages. So later on in the class we'll do work that's more specific towards Java and understanding object oriented programming. But the basics of computer science will remain the same regardless of what language you are programming in. Learning objective one shows that it's really all about problem solving. One says apply classic problem solving techniques to simple computational and information management problems. A, describe challenges that exist when interacting with a computer. B, explain the following tasks, understanding the problem, designing an algorithm, writing a program. C, describe the problem that exists for a given scenario or description. And D, document an algorithm using pseudocode for a given problem. So this learning objective could be the same regardless of programming language. Um, in fact, you don't really even need a programming language at all to think about how an algorithm works because 1D talks about pseudocode. You don't even need a specific language to do that. You could write it in English. Anyway, let me get into what a computer is and then how we interact with it. I have here a photograph of two women from NACA in the 1940s. They are taking air pressure readings. NACA is the predecessor to NASA. Now, my question to you all is, are these women computers? The answer to that is yes. Back before we had digital computers, we actually had humans doing math laboriously by hand for doing things like comet trajectory calculations, maybe trajectories for cannons, uh, for wartime, all these sorts of things. So before we had digital computers, we had people computers. That means a computer has only two functions. It performs calculations and it remembers results. That's it. But now that we have digital computers, we're gonna have programmers. And you as the programmer, you get to build up the calculations that a digital computer will do for you. Now, you as the programmer need to be able to talk to the computer. So you need to understand how the computer takes in data. How does it process information? In general, data refers to words, numbers, figures, sounds, and graphics and it can be used to represent anything. In particular, a computer uses binary digits or bits to represent its data. A series of eight bits is called a byte, B-Y-T-E. And so a thousand bytes is a kilobyte, 1000 kilobytes is a megabyte, 1000 megabytes is a gigabyte, 1000 gigabytes is a terabyte. You might be familiar with some of these prefixes because you know, for example, that your phone has 64 gigabytes of space, things like that. So now, remember, a computer performs calculations and it remembers the results. The bytes, bits and bytes here are really how that computer is going to store those results. That's how information is stored in a computer. That's the data of a computer. To understand bits a little bit better, I have here an example of a light bulb. Think about this light bulb. It can either be off or on. So how many states can it have? Good, it can have two states. And previously I said bits are the ones and zeros of a computer. So you can really think about off as being zero and on as being one. And basically what you're doing with this computer to store data is there's either a voltage being sent through or not. Basically, is that light bulb on or not? And that's gonna tell you one of two things. Well, just having one light bulb is not enough. I already talked about having like a terabyte of space. So we need to add some more light bulbs. What are the states that two light bulbs can have? How many are there? Think about this as the number of combinations of off and on that the two light bulbs can have. Okay, good. 
So there are four combinations. The first one is 0, 0. Another one is 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So the light bulbs, when there are two of them, have four different states. You can expand this to as many light bulbs as you want. For example, eight light bulbs have uh, two to the eighth states or 256 states. And then the more light bulbs you build up, you end up getting terabytes of space available for your calculations. Looking again at learning objective 1A, I asked that we learn how to describe the challenges that exist when interacting with a computer. One of those challenges is the fact that the computer really only understands ones and zeros. And so we need to figure out a way to interact when we speak basically language, normal text-based language, and the computer does not. So somehow we have to take what we're saying and make it into something that the computer knows how to use. Now, to interact with a computer, there is some way to do input and some way to get output. Input, you know, you might get data through a keyboard, a file, a sensor, maybe some other kind of device. So you're typing, sending something to the computer. And then the computer is going to do some sort of computation on it, and it'll give you output. It'll display data on the screen, or it will send data to a file or other device. So basically, you're just sending in this input somehow and getting out output. And then inside, the computer has to figure out how to deal with the information that it's been given. So even though each type of computer has its own unique de design, they internally share the same type of hardware. The two most important hardware components are going to be your processor, or CPU, and memory. A processor does simple calculations, and the memory, or RAM, temporarily stores um, some kind of information. So you see here on the screen, um, I have just some pictures of what that basic memory and what a processor would look like if you've ever um, built your own computer or ripped open an old computer, you might have seen these images before in some version of that. The memory contains a bunch of data and your sequence of instructions. The processor can be broken down into a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, which can both access the memory directly. The arithmetic logic unit is where all the operations are done. The operations that the arithmetic logic unit can do are really primitive, things like addition or subtraction. Uh, here I have move, add, and, or, XOR. The control unit interacts with the arithmetic logic unit, and like I said, together the control unit and arithmetic logic unit form the processor. The control unit contains a program counter. When you load a sequence of instructions, the program counter starts at the first sequence, at the first instruction. It gets what the instruction is, and then it will send it to the arithmetic logic unit. The arithmetic logic unit will see what operations are being done, and it might need to get some data. So it might need to grab numbers from memory. For example, if you're adding two numbers, it might find those two numbers and then add them together and then store it back into memory. Once the arithmetic logic unit is done, the program counter is going to increase by one. So we go to the next sequence in the instruction set. Sometimes it just goes linearly instruction by instruction, but you can also have instructions that do certain kinds of tests and end up with some kind of control flow. So if the output of some operation that the arithmetic logic unit does is true or false, it might send you all the way back to the beginning or it might have you continue the count. So that's what control flow means. Let's talk about what data when stored in memory looks like a little bit more. A variable is a memory location with a name and a type that stores a value. So when we store data in memory, we do need to be able to access it again later. So let's say I want to store the letters H, E, L, L, and O. 
I might put the letter H at memory address 2000. And later on, if I need to grab that letter H, I'll have a handle for accessing it to pull it back um, to be used for different instructions later on. Now that we understand what the architecture of a computer looks like, let's talk about what it actually means to code the program. You will either use an integrated development environment, such as Eclipse, JetBrains, or NetBeans, or just a simple text editor like Notepad++, Sublime Text, VS Code, or Atom when you code a program. You are literally typing in your code into an editor using the keyboard. In this class, of course, we use VS Code, and you might use some of these other text editors or IDEs in the future. And then you're going to have a particular language that you are typing in to your editor. You can type in a high level language or a low level language. A high level language is closer to what we might understand as speech. It requires less work on your part to type it in, but it tends to be less efficient. And of course, in this class, we use Java. Java uses a compiler to translate the Java code that you wrote into machine code, something that the computer can understand. On the other hand, you may just write your machine code yourself, low level languages. Um, it's more efficient, but it requires a lot more work. I have an example here move zero sum, move num ac, add sum ac, store sum tote. So if you write lines like that, that's something the computer can understand right away because those are the operations the arithmetic logic unit has. Um, but it's not quite so obvious to you what's happening here. I have here an example of different programming languages and what their syntax will look like. So these are three different high level languages. In the center, I have Java. Mm, and basically what I want to say is I want to declare a variable called x and I want to set the value 5 to it. We saw the memory address before so we're going to name something x and we're going to set 5 in there. Mm, similarly in Python we can just write x equals 5 and it will do basically the same thing and in JavaScript we'll write var x is equal to 5 and both JavaScript and Java have um, semicolons to end the lines. So different programming languages all say the same thing, but they do it differently. So they use different syntax to convert source code into something that the computer can understand. The source file that you write goes through a compiler or in the case of Python, an interpreter to produce machine code. And after compiling, you will have an executable file that runs or executes. Now let's move on to talking about problem solving techniques. Step one to be able to solve a problem is we need to be able to describe the problem that exists for a given scenario or description. And then once you can do that, you can create an algorithm to solve that problem, which we'll talk about how to document an algorithm using pseudocode for that given problem. To be able to understand a problem, we need to talk about knowledge. All knowledge can be thought of as declarative or imperative. Declarative knowledge is statements of fact. So pi is equal to 3.14159, or we are on earth are statements of fact. You may need these as starting conditions for the problem that you are trying to solve. From there, we have imperative knowledge. This is kind of like how to knowledge. Um, you might think of it as a recipe or you can think of it as an algorithm. Basically, it's a sequence of steps that gets you to some sort of output. So if I tell you the area of a circle is area is equal to pi r squared, you can use a starting condition, pi is equal to 3.14159, and maybe I tell you radius is equal to one, you can now calculate the area. Similarly, I've told you a starting condition is we are on Earth, and you wanna get a satellite into orbit, maybe the first step to do that is to put a satellite on a rocket. Once you have your starting conditions and you know the declarative knowledge, you can start thinking about your imperative steps. So that's what it means to design an algorithm. An algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations 
especially by a computer. So a human, remember, can be a computer. They may also follow a process or set of rules to calculate outputs. When you are designing an algorithm, you want to plan out your program using pseudocode, which is a combination of natural language and programming commands. So basically, when you're writing your list of steps of what you want to do, you can just think about it in a high level way. Write down those steps using English or maybe some code that you are familiar with to get started. And then from there, you can think about how to translate that into actual code that can be typed in to your text editor. To clarify what I mean by writing pseudocode, I have here an example. So the example format, let's say mm, we are doing area of a circle. First, you would write the algorithm and give it a name. So I might call it algorithm area circle. And then think about your inputs. So the input that I know, um, we know that pi is equal to 3.14159. And maybe I've told you already that the radius r is equal to 1. Then the output is going to be the actual area. And from there, you can write a description of the steps needed to solve the problem. So go ahead and just start numbering uh, by 1. And maybe the first step, knowing that area is equal to pi r squared, I would start by calculating r squared, which is just 1. And then I would multiply pi by r squared to get 3.14159. And then finally, I would return the area, which is, again, 3.14159. This is a very specific example where I've inputted the radius. Um, but you can do this more generally without having a value for the radius there. For a problem like calculating the area of a circle, that's something that I did by hand. I was being a computer on the previous slide, even as I was writing that pseudocode. But instead of being a computer, I might need to think about being a programmer, because maybe the calculations are way too hard to do by hand. On this slide, I have here an example of a programmer, Margaret Hamilton, um, who was somebody who worked on the Apollo missions sending a spacecraft, a manned spacecraft, to the moon. An example of the kind of programming she might have done is with punch cards. So they literally went in and like punched out things in cards which represented data that could then be read by a computer in order to do calculations. The numbers used for the Apollo mission might look something like this. This sheet has some inputs and outputs, including things like latitude, longitude, altitude, which are all inputs that are needed to know where the spacecraft is and to do further calculations towards sending that spacecraft towards the moon. Now, this is already getting very complicated to do by hand, so it starts to make sense why we want to use a digital computer to do it. So, so far, that's been very philosophical and historical, but we don't use punch cards anymore. You're actually going to type into the terminal. And so to do that, I'm going to show you your first program. It's going to be a hello world, which is usually how you get started in any programming language. So for Java, we're going to start with creating this class, public class welcome with an open curly brace, then public static void main, parentheses, string, um, open bracket, close bracket, args, close parentheses, open curly brace. And here we have uh, a comment saying we're going to display the hello world message. To print out the hello world message, we're going to use system.out.println and then hello world in quotes. Then we're going to display the 9 times 2 equals message, which is system.out.print and inside parentheses, 9 times 2 equals, I have a space there. So one thing I want to point out here is that um, the first message has print lin, but this has print. Print lin will create a new line after, 
and print does not. Then I'm going to display the result of 9 times 2, and I'm just going to have system.out.println, again, so it's going to create a new line, 9 times 2. Close curly brace, close curly brace. Okay, so I know here we haven't talked about what any of these terms, like public, class, um, static void, string, args, any of this, we don't know what it means quite yet. That's something that we'll get into later on in the class. For now, what I want you to take away is that Java has comments. So if you have um, two forward slashes, it comments out the code, and the compiler is not going to look at it. So comments are plain English that helps the programmer understand the code. Usually you just write out in English what you are doing before you write the code. In fact, if you have your pseudocode set up and you've written English sentences there, you might actually use that as your starter, starting with comments, to write Java code. Here we have actual code. So system.out.print, that's some Java syntax, which means print something out. And inside of the print, we have something in quotes. It's a literal. A literal is just a value that appears in source code where it's exactly the thing that we want it to be rather than being like a variable, which we'll talk about uh, more later. Um, hello world is also a literal. It's a string literal. Uh, nine times two equals is a string literal. Um, so these are things that we will see uh, more and more of as we get more comfortable with the syntax of Java. Cool. So hopefully um, we have gotten a chance to type this program out and try to compile it. Um, so let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Great, so let's take a look at what the compilation and running of the program looks like. First, um, you're probably inside VS Code. You're going to save your program as welcome.java, and then you're going to run java c welcome.java. So what java c does is it compiles the program into machine code. Java c is a type of compiler, so it takes what you've written in high level and then transforms it into something that's readable by the computer. Once you're done with that, you can actually run the program with Java welcome. So you use the Java command to actually run it. Now, when you run Java welcome, it prints out those print commands that you had written in the code, which is hello world and nine times two equals 18. So you can see how it actually calculated nine times two to equal 18. So those print statements are what are outputted to the command prompt terminal. Finally, I'll leave you with some questions to test your understanding of this presentation. I will read the questions out loud and provide answers, but I recommend pausing the video, writing these down, trying to think of the answer. You can even go back through the video to try to find where those answers were described. Question one. What takes your high-level code and transforms it into machine code? A compiler does that. You may have also thought of Java C as the particular compiler used for Java. Two, what are some basic operations you'd expect to be able to do with an arithmetic logic unit? Some of these were mentioned before. It included things like move, add, and XOR. Those are some examples. And three, this one is pretty open-ended. What are some problems you'd be interested in writing algorithms for? I've been using the space example throughout, so maybe you were inspired by that. Whatever answer you have here is fine. Um, we wrote programs to send a manned spacecraft to the moon, but nobody has been on the moon in over 50 years, so I would be somewhat interested in writing programs to put more people on the moon, which we are doing, well, NASA is doing currently with the Artemis program, whatever state that's in. Today we talked about applying classic problem solving techniques to simple computational and information management problems. So we did not talk about the specific problem solving techniques, just that there are some, 
and namely that you would do them via writing algorithms. A, describe challenges that exist when interacting with a computer. The challenges were basically that you have to figure out how to properly get input to the computer in a way that it understands. Um, B, explain the following tasks, understanding the problem, designing an algorithm, writing a program. We talked about this at a high level and I gave some examples such as how to calculate the area of a circle, um, maybe how to think about um, doing calculations for space travel. C. Describe the problem that exists for a given scenario or description. Um, this was something that we talked about alongside the pseudocode example. Um, you needed to be able to understand what the problem is, describe it in terms of input and output, and write a sequence of steps. Um, so being able to describe the input and output and what you want the relationship between those to be is what that problem is. And then D, document an algorithm using pseudocode for a given problem, which uh, I showed an example of writing pseudocode for calculating the area of a circle. And we also looked at some, not pseudocode, but regular code for hello world. Um, so we're starting to look at syntax. You may also use syntax as part of your pseudocode. And that's all I have for this introduction. Um, so thanks for watching.